Today's interview features Rod Baggett, poet and author of The Poet and the Professor, Homes for Building Reading Skills. Dear Mr. Witherspoon, I'm afraid of ghosts. I know there's no such thing as real ghosts, but things don't have to be real to be scary. A make-believe ghost is just as scary as a real one. Your friend, David Verderambi. Phantom fear. When I am in my bed at night, I always have to have a light. Without it, there would be no way for me to keep the ghost away. Kooky, spooky, screechy specters, stinky, clinky chain collectors, frosty breath of frozen fright, haunting houses every night. My daddy says they aren't real, which doesn't change the way I feel, because in the dark, when I can't see, they seem as real as real can be. Sneaky, creaky, peaky prowlers, tiny, shiny, whiny howlers, floating fluffs of smoky gray, hiding at the edge of day. Deep down, I know my dad is right, but knowing doesn't ease the fright. I guess it's quite a combination, darkness and imagination. There are no ghosts beneath my bed. What scares me most is in my head. It's really strange. How can it be? The thing I fear the most is me. <laughs> Hi, I'm Connie Medina, Editorial Director for Shell Education. As most teachers have experienced, poetry can be a vibrant and motivating influence in the classroom. So it's no surprise that when a new and exciting buzz surfaces involving poetry, we are all ears. Today I'd like to introduce Broad Baggert. Broad is a former attorney turned full-time poet who has written 15 books of poetry for children and adults. He's also one of the authors of Shell Education's series, The Poet and the Professor, Poems for Building Reading Skills. We are excited to have him here with us today, ready to provide us with some new and refreshing ideas for using poetry in our instruction. Welcome aboard, Broad. Thank you, Connie. So your story on becoming a poet is very inspiring. Can you tell us a little bit about your process? Uh, I was born in a dark and stormy night. <laughs> uh, as you said, I, I, as an adult, I began life as a as a trial lawyer and then an elected official, uh, and I, uh, I lived in the dark hall, halls of courtrooms and political intrigue. And um, but I've always loved poetry. I had studied a lot of poetry in high school and college and written a lot of poetry. Um, and, but it never for a moment occurred to me that I could actually become a poet. Uh, as a matter of fact, the standard line is, uh, there's no such thing, you can't make a living as a poet. Uh, so it never even occurred to me, never considered it. Uh, then uh, uh, right in the middle of my political legal career, my children uh, in their elementary school had these um, elocution programs where they would select poems and recite the poems in front of an audience, uh, and there would be winners, and they would win a blue ribbon, you know. Um, and my youngest daughter, uh, who was just 22 months younger th than the older daughter, and close enough to be competitive, but not close enough to s compete successfully with an older sister, uh, had always sort of taken the back seat. Oh, I can't do that. Uh, she's turned out to be a dynamite, <laughs> aggressive, successful young woman, you know. But back then, she, we didn't know, the idea of Colette embracing a competition was, was uh, uh, a real anomaly for her. And she, uh, so she announced that she wanted to uh, enter the elocution contest and that she wanted to win it. Uh, so my wife started looking through all these books for poems for Colette to recite. And it was very difficult to find a poem that she could successfully recite. Um, what we were looking for was a poem in the voice of a child. So that when Colette got up to recite the poem, she didn't have to become high you know, she could be a child was saying things that felt like what she would say, that is, her voice. She said it to my face, Alvin, she said, stop flirting with me. And I was flabbergasted. First of all, I was not flirting with her. I was being nice to her. She's new at our school. She was, million monarch butterflies were twirling in my belly. But then I started thinking. So I write in lots of, I also write poems that are dramatic, that is they specifically have dramatic content. They're not just monologues about how I feel or observations or pictures and words. If I have a picture and words, it's because I'm drawing a picture for somebody about to jump into it and do something. 
because I think what, what makes a poem interesting is what makes anything interesting is that there's dramatic, the dramatic elements. And the dramatic elements are a character uh, pursuing a goal who experiences a conflict and expresses emotion. And at the moment that we observe as a listener or, an, uh, or a reader, a character experiencing a conflict and expressing an emotion, we perform the act of identification. Roshanda, I began, this leaf is capable of photosynthesis because it contains a remarkable protein that scientists call Avin, <laughs> she said, interrupting my explanation. I know all about Rubisco. It's probably the most abundant protein on Earth. It's important for its ability to catalyze the chemical reaction. This poem is not about somebody else. It's about me. This movie's not about somebody else. It's about me. This novel's not about somebody else. It's about me. And when the poem or the movie or the novel is about you, you're interested. Uh, so in that context, writing dramatically in voice, I then can put all kind of stuff, you know, philosophy, science, you know, just gross humor, any, and can sometimes combine all three in the same poem, and, and, and the sky is the limit on which you can communicate to the listener once you've captured voice, dramatic reading, and achieved identification.